This is uh, blood sampling lecture. Uh, blood sampling is one of the pre-analytical measures which are very important in affecting the result. Uh, as we say, uh, the sample you send equals the result you, the result you get. Okay. These sampling are CLSI guidelines, meaning the Clinical and Laboratory Standard Institute. Uh, the steps for blood sampling include this, the following. Uh, test request, then you should identify the patient, prepare the patient, prepare supplies, position of the patient, put your BBE, apply tourniquet, select the vein, clean the site, vein puncture, fill the tube in order, remove tourniquet, place gauze, remove the needle, dispose device, Apply pressure, bandage, label the tube, handling, then immediate transport to the lab. All these uh, steps should be followed for uh, blood sampling. The first and very important step, you should identify the patient. As we know, we have two accepted unique identifiers in our hospital. The first is full four names and the ID number, uh, you should use proper positive identification. You should involve the patient in the identification process, ask him about his name. In patient and infant, you should also check the identification band. If there is outpatient infant, you should ask a family member, check the patient name and identification with the request form. The request form must be identical to the patient identification you make. Prepare the patient. As a general rule, the, the best sample is what we know as what is known as basal state collection. Basal state collection, it is the preferable for all blood tests to be collected in the morning from 7 to 9 a.m. Add this sample, fasting could easily last for 12 hours and only water is permitted. No coffee, no uh, tea. In the morning of the sample, no cigarette smoking and no caffeine drinks. Okay. Preparing of the patient. Some uh, tests need fasting as glucose glucose only eight hours if you prolong the period of fast your liver start producing gl glycogen and changing it to glucose it will be it will not be an accurate result only eight hours is needed for glucose also triglyceride we need a fasting period which is more prolonged but only 12 hours Physical activity. Physical activity affects the result of some tests. The patient need to be at rest at least 15 minutes before sampling. Timing. Some uh, tests, especially hormones, need a special time for uh, withdrawal. Uh, as we know, female hormones, LH and FSH, should be taken at the second day of the cycle. However, Progesterone at the 21, 21st day of the cycle. Cortisol, which is has a, uh, what is known as circadian rhythm, it must be taken at 8 a.m. To continue preparation of the patient, we should talk about medication. If we are going to measure postprandial glucose, you should um, teach your patient that after taking the fasting sample, ask the patient to take a meal and therapy, oral or insulin-like routine. Don't just tell him to you know, fast for eight hours, then come and take the fasting sample and then take your meal and come to for the postprandial sample. No, you should uh, you know, teach him to take his meal and then the therapy before taking the two hour uh, postprandial sample. In case of drug uh, monitoring, 
Observation to reach the steady state concentration should, in, in case of uh, antibiotic, maybe he, um, he needs to take more than uh, uh, three samples. Uh, for uh, drugs, we can you know, measure both what is known as the trough level and the peak level. The trough level is the sample of before the dose. The sample before the dose gives us um, an idea about the steady state concentration and if the drug we give reaching the concentration which is effective for the patient. However, peak level is the sample just after the dose. It tells us about toxicity. So, if we want to know about toxicity of the drug, we measure the peak level, which is the concentration of the drug in plasma after, just after the dose. However, if we want to know is the drug reaching the concentration, which is effective for killing bacteria or effective for his mechanism of action, we should here measure the trough level as we will take the sample just before the dose. Okay. In measuring hormones as T3 and T4 and TSH, thyroid hormone, don't take the drug the morning of the sample as it affects the result. So if someone or some of your patient is coming to follow the thyroid hormone level, she is taking the drug, okay, ask her to omit the dose of the morning before withdrawal of the sample. This will give you false high result and will not give you uh, an idea about the, uh, the level during the day. We need to make sure that T3 and T4 are in, at the appropriate level and they are controlling TSH at the uh, lowest level. Okay. Prepare your equipment. Before withdrawal of the sample, you should prepare your equipment. Uh, everything you need should be beside you. Uh, and don't forget to take the request form. Position of the patient. Never take the sample from a standing patient. Some uh, patient will have a vagal reflex and may just drop uh, during withdrawal of the sample. No matter he is, how healthy he is or how physical uh, uh, good he is, or his physical state he is, he might be just to drop like this. So never take the sample from a standing patient. Must sit on arm chair and if necessary lie down. May, because he may faint. Don't change the position from lying down to sitting. This is, uh, this leads what we call as a hemoconcentration process. If the patient is lying down, on, in, in, especially in patient, if the patient is lying down, don't ask her just to sit down. This movement makes hemoconcentration, it moves the fluid outside the blood vessel and may increase uh, uh, our test, light, test result by uh, 10%. As regard to hemoglobin, it may increase up to 15%. Uh, I, I want to you know, make comment about this hemoglobin result. If your patient is just moving from lying down to sitting, and suppose her hemoglobin result is 10, 10 milligram per deciliter, 10 gram per deciliter. So it may increase up to 1.5, gram per deciliter due to this wrong movement. You, if you take a sample, it may measure 11.5 instead of uh, 10. Also, if your result is supposed to be 7 and it is the level of blood transfusion, it will read 8.2 and it will not be given blood according to this result because this wrong movement. This wrong movement may increase hemoglobin up to 1.5 gram per deciliter just because you ask your patient to change the position from lying down to sitting. Only allow it from standing to sitting and from sitting to uh, lying down and not the opposite, okay? 
Some tests are as adrenaline may increase up to 50% due to change of the position. So positioning of the patient is very, very important uh, as it affects the result you will get. Tourniquet. A tourniquet should be applied for fingers about, above the puncture site to make vein visible. If too close, it may cause hematoma. It should not be applied more than one minute to avoid hemoconcentration concentration and false increase in proteins and cells. If you apply the tourniquet for more than one minute, you will remove it and, uh, and it, يعني, take rest for two minutes, then be applied. The patient can make a fist but not fist clenching. He, he might close his hand but not uh, doing this fist clenching of opening and closing his hand. That will increase potassium, lactate, and decrease ionized calcium. Don't use tonic for lactate, ammonia, albumin, and calcium. These are highly affected by the tonic application. Select the vein. Select, selection of the vein, you should take your time before selection of the vein, but as it is affect the quality of the sample and affect also the patient satisfac satisfaction. If you choose a very small vein and you try and you try and retry, this will make the, your patient upset. The best site are medium cubital vein, cephalic vein, and basalic vein. Never take blood from the arm on the side of mastectomy. If you have a patient with uh, mastectomy operation, don't take uh, your blood sample from the arm on this side because it will be uh, there will be more lymph and more affection of the result from edematous area, from area with hematoma, the arm in which the blood is transfused, arm with vestula or vascular graft. Don't take the sample from sites above the intravenous cannula. If you are ob obliged to take the sample from the arm with intravenous cannula, Make sure you are taking the sample below, below the cannula, not above the cannula. Here are some uh, pictures showing us this anadimitous hand. This is the uh, arm close to the side of mastectomy. This is uh, an arm with um, scar and this arm with uh, intravenous cannula. All these parts don't talk, uh, take the sample from these uh, sites. I want to take the sample from cannula. Use it if newly inserted for the first time. If you, are, you have just inserted the cannula, you can take the sample from it. If the cannula is the only available site, you have no other site. But you have conditions here should, should be followed. Shut off the flow for three minutes and report this in the patient chart. Draw 5 to 10 milliliter of blood and discard them before taking the sample. It should be not done for neonate. All their blood is only uh, 100 milliliter per, uh, uh, per kilogram. Don't discard the 10 milliliter of their blood. Clean the site. Use only 70% acyl alcohol in, proper, in the proper technique from the center uh, in a circular man manner outward. Wait 30 seconds to air dry. Don't just apply the alcohol and then uh, withdraw the sample. The, why we will wait 30 seconds to allow the antiseptic effect to prevent the hemolysis of RBCs during withdrawal to prevent the burning sensation during venipuncture. Iodine affects the results of chemistry. And don't, you, don't try to clean your site by using alcohol followed by iodine. This is done only for blood culture, not for routine culture. Iodine affects the results of chemistry. Uh, don't touch the site after cleaning. Fill the tubes in order. When you uh, withdraw, uh, blood for many uh, test result we have to uh, put them in uh, tube in order the first tube to fill is the blood culture um, the blood culture tube uh, should be withdrawn under, under complete aseptic uh, process then you will uh, start with the 
tube for coagulation. It is the citrate tube followed by the serum tube, the CBC tube, and at last the fluoride tube or gray tube. So you will start with blood culture tube, then the coagulation, chemistry, CBC, and at last the fluoride tube if you need. Okay. Every tube should be mixed. As a general rule, uh, mix by inverting the tube uh, and the rest and the movement from the rest. You will uh, hold the tube like this and invert it slightly in, in uh, a smooth movement from the rest, like this. As a general, all tubes need mixing from eight to ten times, except coagulation tubes, only four times. So mixing needed for eight to ten times, except for the uh, citrate tube and coagulation tube, only four time inversion. Uh, as for uh, serum tubes, they are needed to coagulate, co to be coagulated. Uh, it may take uh, five times of inversion. So even blood culture needs uh, to be co uh, inverted for eight to ten times. Okay. Label of the tube. You will label the tube after taking the sample, but at the site of collection. Never take the sample to the uh, counter outside the room and start labeling them. No, you will take the sample and label them at the site of collection. Label contains the full name, ID of the patient, and also the time of drawing and the name of phlebotomist. Here we have uh, uh, OSIS system and which uh, identifies the point to be uh, printed on the label. Um, handling and the transport. Some uh, samples need a special handling before transport to the uh, lab. As we know, ABG, ammonia, and lactate need shelling. It must be put in ice. Protect from light as bilirubin. Uh, during the transport, you should put it in a leak-proof plastic bag, which is by our biohazard bag, in an enclosed container and the transport to the lab immediately. Thank you. That's all the time. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Number one is VAP. What is VAP? VAP is ventilator-associated pneumonia. A pneumonia where the patient was on mechanical ventilation for more than two calendar days on the date of event with day of ventilator placement being day one. The ventilator was in place on the date of event or the day before. VAP is not monitored after the patient is discharged from the facility. So in our hospital, we have this one, ventilator associated pneumonia surveillance form. Okay, you need to first put, fill up the patient ID, the plan date, which month you need to use the English calendar and then the date of birth, gender, male or female, then the location. Is it in ICU and ICU or other inpatient area? You will only fill up this one, section two, admission information, hospital stay, then ICU or NICO stay, date of discharge. And if the location is in NICO, you need to write the birth weight and gestational age. Section three is ventilator information. So how many ventilators was in, number of times ventilator was used. So you need to fill up the insertion date, the date, the month, and year. For instance, um, December, so the date 01, month 12, year 2020. Then when did they remove the ventilator? So they remove after six days. You will also write the date 06, 1, 2, 20. 
for intubation, you will just choose either elective emergency or NA. You will write it here. One, two, or three. That's it. If there is VAP event information, the infection control department or the doctor will be the one to fill up this data. The next one is your adult ventilator bundle form. This is very important. Bundle form. So you will write the patient ID, surveillance plan date. Then you need to follow the bundles. We have five. Elevation of the head of the bed between 30 and 45 degrees. Daily sedation, PUD, DVT, daily oral care, and overall compliance. So, you need to write here the date and month. So, you will write 01, what's the month? 12, like that. Did you elevate the head of the bed? You will just tick yes. Did you do daily sedation? You will tick yes. Peptic ulcer disease prophylaxis, did you give yes? Deep venous thrombosis, DVT prophylaxis, unless contraindicated. So if not contraindicated, you will just put yes. Daily oral care, yes. And overall, if all of these are yes, you can take this one. That's it. It should be done daily. And for the neonates, we have also another for neonatal pedi or pediatric ventilator bundle for. Same section 1, you need to put the patient and hospital information, surve surveillance plan date, the date of birth, it's very important, the gender, and location. So here we have 9 bundle variables. Elevation of head of the bed, daily assessment of readiness to extubate, PUD, DVT, daily oral care every 4 hours, keeping the vent circuit free from condensation, Hand hygiene, you are changing the suction. Store oral suction device in a clean, non sealed plastic bag when not in use. So you will just take it. Yes. If you did all of this, you will put yes, 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 and yes. And then every, so if we're going to make rounds, we are checking this one. This bundle form is very important. Because it will help you to prevent ventilator-associated pneumonia. Okay. Next, we have the second device-related infection is central line-associated bloodstream infection or CLAB c CLAB c is a laboratory-confirmed primary bloodstream infection where central line or umbilical catheter was in place for more than two calendar days on the date of event, with day of device placement being day one. And a central line or umbilical catheter was in place on the date of event or the day before. If a central line or umbilical catheter was in place for more than two calendar days and then removed, the date of the event of the Local bloodstream infection must be the day of device discontinuation or the next day. We also have the form. This one. Central line associated bloodstream surveillance form. You will only fill up the demographic data section 1, which is the patient and hospital information. Section 2, admission information, hospital stay, then discharge date. Then section 3, central line information. So location of central line insertion, either where in the umbilical, on the jugular, like that. Then you will write also the insertion date, the date, month, and year, and the removal. And then if, it's, if your central line is non-tunneled, tunneled, portable, peripheral, percutaneous, or peak. Then type 2 if it's temporary or permanent. For us, we are using the temporary umbilical catheter. Then site, jugular, subclavian, femoral, umbilical, or others. In our hospital, most of the time, we are using this umbil umbilical for new needs. Then the lumen, if it's single or multiple, we are using the single lumen. This section 4, it will be for the infection control department or the doctor if bloodstream infection is diagnosed. Then, we also have the central line bundle form. You will fill up the patient and hospital information and 
this one, section 2, bundle variables. This is the most important. Did the doctor do hand hygiene? You will put yes. Then, when he inserted the UVC, did he wear cap, mask, sterile gloves, gown, and the drape? Yes. It's Number three, chlorhexidine skin antisepsis. So, if this is not available, what we have in our hospital is the povidone iodine. And then, op optimal catheter site selection. Where did they insert the umbilical catheter? Subclavian vein for adults, femoral or pediatrics, and umbilical or peak. Okay. Then, the fifth one is your daily review of central line necessity. You will put the date, month, and year. If you are reviewing it daily, so you will you need to fill up this data and you will put yes. Then the third one is our, the third device related infection is catheter associated urinary tract infection or CAUT. What is CAUT? A UTI where an indwelling urinary catheter was in place for more than two calendar days on the date of the event with day of device placement being day one. An indwelling urinary catheter was in place on the date of event or the day before. If an indwelling urinary catheter was in place for more than two calendar days and then removed, the date of event for the UTI must be the day of discontinuation or the next day for the UTI to be catheter associated. We also have this catheter-associated urinary tract infection surveillance form. Same as the others, you will fill up the demographic data, section 1. Section 2, the admission information. Section 3, urinary catheter information. Location of the urin urinary catheter insertion. Maybe they inserted in MAT1. So, you will write here maternity 1. Insertion date, what's the date did they insert the catheter? Then for section 4, it will be filled up by the doctor. So for us, only section 1, 2, and 3. And the bundle, urinary catheter bundle. Okay, so you will write here the surve surveillance plan date, month. Then the follow-up location. So when they inserted in MAT1, the follow-up is in ICU. So you need to take it, ICU. Then the patient ID. Catheter insertion location, you will write here again MAT1 because the catheter was inserted in MAT1. Then you will write the patient ID. So you will follow this one. Avoid unnecessary urinary catheter. Number two, insert using aseptic technique. Number three, appropriate maintenance. And number four, daily review of catheter necessity. Here, you will just take it like that, daily. Let's see. And the last one is SSI, or what is known as the surgical site infection. We have types of surgical site infection. An SSI typically occur within 30 days after surge surgery. So we have the CDC describes three types of surgical site infection. Number one is superficial incisional SSI. This infection occurs just in the area of the skin where the incision was made. The second one is deep incisional SSI. This infection occurs beneath the incision area in muscle and the tissue surrounding the muscle. And the third one is organ or space SSI. This type of infection can be in any area of the body other than skin, muscle, and surrounding tissue that was involved in the surgery. This includes a body organ or a space between organs. What are the causes and risk factor of surgical site infection? Infections after surgery are caused by germs. The most common of these include bacteria like the Staphylococcus, Streptococcus, and Pseudomonas. Germs can infect a surgical wound through various forms of contact, such as from the touch of contaminated caregiver, or surgical instrument through germs in the air or through germs that are already on or in your body and then spread into the wound. So, 
we need to fill up this data, surgical site infection surveillance form. You need to fill up the demographic data, the plan date, gender, what procedure, outpatient or inpatient. In, in our hospital, it's inpatient. Okay, then you will fill up this section 2, operative procedure information. Is it multiple procedures? We are only doing CS, right? So it's no. Emergency, is it emergency elective? Emergency, yes. Trauma, no. What anesthesia are we doing? Spinal or general? If it's general, yes. If it's spinal, no. Is the patient diabetic, yes or no? You need to write the height and weight. And then you will write the admission date, discharge date, then date of the procedure. And then for this one, section 3, patient risk index, it should be filled up by the anesthesia, the ASA score. Then section 4, SSI event information, it will come either from the doctor or the infection control. Because every after 30 days, if there is an infection, we will include that in our SSI data. And the last one is your bundle, surgical site infection bundle form. So you will need to fill up the section 1, patient and hospital information, then the bundle variables. The most important thing, appropriate use of antibiotics. So you need to write what antibiotics did they give, name the dose and the route. Or if they've given second antibiotic, you will write antibiotic 1 and 2. And then number the second one is your appropriate hair removal. If hair at the incisional site was clipped, yes or no. Maintenance of post-op glucose control for diabetic and cardiac surgery patient only. Okay. And then the sixth one, maintenance of post-op normothermia. It's for all the patients. Post-op core temperature is normal until 36.1 to 37.1 degrees Celsius. And then, the last one is the overall compliance. If all of these are complied, yes, 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 you can just tick this one only. That's the end. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.